Nobody wants to be interrupted or told that they're wrong. And yet a year ago, it happened to all of us. In March 2020, Canadians became acutely aware of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country made the decision to close our buildings. In an instant, we went from people who gathered primarily in person to people who gathered primarily online. Nobody chooses something like that. Certainly nobody wanted it, but it came and it stayed. This pandemic has caused immense pain and suffering. The losses are horrific, especially for the most vulnerable among us. And we know for certain that everyone is suffering. And as always, we do not suffer equally. Still in the middle of this crisis, we don't yet know what the ultimate resolutions will be. But we've already learned some important things about ourselves, things that can help us as we try to move forward to thrive into the future and create and sustain beloved community. I want to highlight three things we've learned so far. There'll be others, but we'll start with these three. First, we can be nimble. Many of us went from faint recognition of coronavirus to shutdown in days. When our congregations realized that we had to suspend in-person services, the response was swift and we shifted to online platforms. I serve a small congregation, Westwood Unitarian in Edmonton. Some of us had attended meetings on Zoom, but few of us had even hosted one. None of us knew all of the answers, but we were confident that some of us would know a little. So we called on members and friends of the congregation, an online education expert, a musician with tech skills, digital wizards who could help get our elders online. We looked for who likes a tech adventure and learned from their courage. Overnight, continental UU Facebook groups sprang up with a whole lot of questions and a huge variety of ideas. The beauty was that we were cross-pollinating ministers and religious educators together with musicians and administrators, lay leaders and techies, worship teams and video consultants. So often we're separated into specific communities, but this time, like the Reverend Teresa Soto reminds us, all of us needed all of us to make it. I had never experienced this level of sharing, openness, and generosity within our faith community. There was zero competition and full collaboration. The impossible started to become possible, and we were proving we could be nimble. Second, we learned that we can do hard things. Westwood recognized on a Friday that we couldn't safely gather that Sunday. The transition felt massive. How could we pull that off in 48 hours? Then in UU ministers groups, wise beings began reassuring us that it was not a tragedy if we had to miss a week. We could take a minute. We needed time to get people connected. It was okay just to close. Now, no minister, no congregation ever wants to just close, but they were right. And that invitation to breathe, the reminder that it was okay to miss a week, was profound. I was so grateful for their leadership and for all the leaders who have helped us since to make hard decisions about remaining closed, to choose caring for people over needing to be perfect, to reimagine the ways that we do important things. So we closed the building. And we sent our people links to congregations who were already online in case they wanted to visit. And then I went into the sanctuary that Sunday morning and recorded my first ever video, thanking people for staying home and promising them that we would be together soon. We worked with our neighbors, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, sharing the challenge of getting both of us online. We pooled our skills, our ideas, and our humans, creating our first ever Zoom service as a joint effort. We would share services, social events, and tech for months, and when we were ready, we became more independent again. We continue to support one another, and I hope we always will. 
Glennon Doyle, the author of Untamed, always says, we can do hard things, and we do every day. We didn't sign up for this one, but we did it anyway. The third point I want to lift up may not look at first glance like a highlight. We were wrong. We had talked in passing about creating an online presence as outreach and increasing our accessibility, but honestly, it felt really hard. We didn't know how, we didn't know about equipment or costs. We saw larger congregations had started to live stream, but that seemed huge and expensive. And we were a bit tired and there was a lot going on. And to be fair, I was nervous. I had no video experience, I was self-conscious, and I didn't want to embarrass myself or my congregation. So we used the reasons why it seemed too hard to convince ourselves that it wasn't a priority. We were wrong. Another gift of this transition was that we didn't have time to be self-conscious. People needed to connect. They needed comfort. They needed their community to be there for them. And so began our practice of compassionate imperfection. We got out of our own way long enough to take a leap. Sean Loney, a Canadian expert on social enterprise, teaches that what looks like burdens or barriers can be flipped on their head and viewed as assets. High unemployment means we have an available workforce. Fruit rotting on trees in people's yards could be a free resource to interrupt food insecurity. A certified church kitchen sitting empty most of the week can be an opportunity to partner with a social enterprise that puts people to work picking and processing fruit while gaining important skills and supplementing both their income and their diet. Problems become possibilities. We had isolated people with time on their hands who volunteered to learn new ways to deliver a service. Sean talks about just taking a chance, a lean startup. Try something, start small. If it works, expand on it. If it doesn't, learn and pivot. We didn't need live streaming or fancy equipment. We just got a Zoom license and got our folks logged on. The pandemic took away the time for speculation. It interrupted the practice of looking for reasons that we couldn't do it. Instead, we were motivated to find ways that we could. Our why was solid. We needed to be together. What we had was good and valuable and suddenly inaccessible, just when we needed one another the most. We were right that it was unfamiliar and complicated and not ideal, but we were wrong that it would be too hard. Now, people from across the country, from around the world, have been joining us. Friends and family, past members who've moved away, people who Googled winter solstice and found Westwood. We have fewer casual visitors, but those who make the effort to attend seem to be sticking around. Plus, we have had guest speakers and musicians from across the continent with no travel costs. We have become accessible in ways we had never imagined. People whose child can't manage a crowd can now attend church. A healthcare worker can join on their break from the hospital. People take their phone on a walk in the woods and listen in. Someone with allergies is safer in their own home. No one had to brave the minus 40 this winter. Even more, we could watch the recording later on YouTube with captions and volume control. We can choose the best time to watch, listen in bite-sized pieces, or revisit an important message. It's not perfect. There are issues around access to equipment and internet. We miss singing together. We've lost the small private side conversations. Not everyone is comfortable online, so we continue to learn and grow and adapt. We're still trying to steady our course, but we are continuously moving forward. And here's why I'm so excited. I'm here to lift up the idea that noticing when we are wrong is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not an insult. It's a key. 
We didn't choose this pandemic interruption and we weren't actively planning to go online. But we understood that our circumstances had changed and given the absence of in-person services, the value of trying had gone up exponentially. So we pivoted. The question, what if we were wrong, is a key to unlock change. Change is hard. Wouldn't it be good to have a key? Nobody wants to be interrupted or told that they're wrong. And yet we are learning how to roll with it. I was scheduled to give this Confluence lecture last year, but the Halifax conference was canceled. That was hard, but the interruption gave me a deeper understanding of my topic, grounded in this profound lesson that none of us signed up for. We can be nimble. Yes, we can't unknow that. We can do hard things. Yes, we can't unknow that either. But, but there's the catch before we get too self-congratulatory. We didn't go online because of a brilliant com commitment to accessibility. Just like all the workplaces that have refused for years to grant accommodations for people with diverse ways of being in the world. We went online because we didn't have a choice. It was that or nothing. And because we, the best served, were going to become the unserved if we didn't. I'm not asking you to feel bad about that. I'm asking you to notice it, to let it interrupt our understanding of ourselves for just a minute. We have experienced profound benefits of accessibility and it was an accident. Just like we experienced clear skies and cleaner water at the start of the pandemic and it was an accident. We didn't plan it, but we have benefited from it. Now, governments are rolling back environmental protections in response to the economic crisis, like somehow increased devastation of the planet will solve our financial issues in this tragic time. We didn't learn from that breath of fresh air. If we had paused and said, look, we can have a different climate outcome if we work together, we could have taken that fresh air coincidence and turned it into a powerful solution. We don't have to make the same mistake with our congregations. If we pause and say, wow, this is beautiful, how can we continue to build accessibility and cooperation? Then we have the opportunity to permanently transform ourselves toward our ideals of beloved community. And we could share this same skill to help our beloved planet. We would be using interruption as a tool. So here's your invitation at the close of this first part. Reflect on one of your stuck places, something that you would like to make happen, but you don't. Identify the barriers and then ask yourself, what if I was wrong? Write or draw out the problem and the barriers if that helps, because it's way more effective if you don't just do it in your mind. So for example, if it's too hard to get Westwood online was my stuck place. I would ask myself, what if I was wrong? And the answer would be, if I was wrong, then it would be doable. Not knowing how would become asking for help. Self-consciousness would become an opportunity to practice self-compassion. People not knowing how to get online would become an opportunity to connect tech-savvy folks with learners. We'd stop looking for reasons not to do it and look for ways that we can. So choose a stuck place, identify the barriers, and then ask yourself, what if I was wrong? And here are three magic spells to try in case they are helpful. Freedom from self-consciousness. Imagine what you would do if nobody was looking or if everyone was working together cooperatively. Interruption. Imagine that there's no choice. It just has to be done. How will you approach it now? Compassionate imperfection. How would it be different if you promised to be kind and gentle with yourself, with others? 
use the question, what if we were wrong, to turn problems into possibilities. The invitation will be on a slide for the next minute, and there is a downloadable worksheet in the video description below. See you in part two. Do the thing.